How can a Christian stay sexually pure? This is something that every believer can have victory over. You can have victory over sexual sin, over sexual temptation. This is not something that's going to be having you oppressed your whole life. No. The scripture gives us very easy, basic, fundamental things that if we obey them, if we submit to them, we will begin to have victory. Do you know who a victorious person is? Do you know who a wise person is? A victorious person is not someone who never messes up. It's not someone who doesn't have struggles, who doesn't have faults, no. A victorious person, a wise person, is someone who knows their weaknesses and they prepare beforehand. They plan ahead. So they know what their weaknesses are and they plan ahead for those things so that whenever that opportunity presents itself, they already have some safeguards. Let me give you a very easy example. I'm here to tell you the gospel is simple, very, very simple. When people are trying to lose weight or develop healthy lifestyles, you can look up any video and almost every personal trainer unanimously will tell you one of the first things they need to do is look at their refrigerator and look at their pantry and take away everything that is sugary, take away everything that is unhealthy, take away everything that is an unhealthy snack because if it's in reach, most likely if it's in your reach, when you get hungry, when you get hangry, when that appetite, when that craving hits you, you're going to go straight to your pantry, you're going to go straight to the refrigerator, and you're going to begin to indulge in things that are not healthy for yourself. Same thing in the spiritual life. If it's in reach, if you're always around it, if you don't surround yourself with like-minded people, but you're surrounding yourself with people who are minded in the world, founded and grounded in the world, people who don't have your same convictions, people who don't have your same standards. That's why going to church is very important because you're going to get around like-minded people, not perfect, just like you're not perfect, but they're like-minded people who are following the convictions, who are living with the standard according to the word of God, and they're going to be able to help you. But just like that person, who's trying to develop healthy lifestyles, if they get hungry, if they get those cravings and they have those snacks, that ice cream, so easily attainable, they're going to go and do it. They're going to go and eat it. They're going to go and self-indulge. But if it's not there, then most likely they're not going to eat it if it's not close to them, if it's not there. Same thing in the Christian life. God has given us very easy, fundamental things, principles that can give everyone victory over sexual sin, over sexual temptation. And listen to what the scripture says here. I want to read you the first one. Proverbs chapter 7, verse 22 through 23. I want to read you what the world wants to accomplish by this, what the ways of the world wants to do in a believer's life. Look what God compares a believer listening to this lifestyle, listening to this temptation, uh, falling in the hands of this, surrendering themselves to this. Look what the scripture compares a man or a woman to that. Look what it says. All at once he follows her, talking about the adulterous woman, the sensual woman. All at once he follows her, and as an ox goes to the slaughter, in other words, He's following her the same way an ox is going to slaughter. An ox is in line. An ox is going to slaughter. And an ox is as happy as can be. An ox doesn't know that it's about to be slaughtered. And then look what else he continues to say. Or as a stag is caught fast till an arrow pierces its liver. As a bird rushes into a snare, he does not know that it will cost him his life. So this is something serious. This is not something that's something to play around with, something that's a joke. No, this is a very serious issue. And it is a serious issue because it's one of the most talked about issues. It's one of the most issues that people have so much condemnation and guilt over. But the Bible is saying the same way an ox is going to the slaughter, the same way that an arrow pierces the liver of a, of a deer. Have you ever seen a hunter shoot a deer with an arrow? It goes straight through the deer. And the Bible is saying that's the same thing when a man or a woman listens to the temptation of this world, submits themselves to the temptation of this world. The end goal of this is to pierce your liver. The end goal of this is to destroy you. And then he says, it's like a bird caught in a net. It wants to capture you. Are you captured yet? Are you destroyed yet? You might say, oh yes, I'm destroyed, I'm captured. But I want to tell you, if you still got breath in your lungs, you are not destroyed. Because you are still alive, there is still an opportunity to begin to live a new life today. Right now, there is an opportunity for change. There is an opportunity for repentance. You are not destroyed yet. You are not caught yet. You might say, oh no, yes I am. You don't understand. I've been dealing with this, battling with this. I've been struggling with this for many, many years. Listen, greater is he who lives in you than the one in the world who is against you. It's not over yet. 
You ain't destroyed yet. And today is the day of repentance. Today is the day of change. So listen to some basic principles that scripture gives us, the believer, what we can do to have victory over this every single day. Look what Paul tells Timothy in the book of 2 Timothy, chapter 2, verse 19 through 22. He's a young preacher. He's a young disciple. And the apostle Paul is giving him some advice. He's giving him, he's giving him some direction to be able to have victory over this type of sin also. And look what he tells him. But God's firm foundation stands, bearing this seal. The Lord knows those who are His. And let everyone who names the name of the Lord depart from iniquity. Iniquity is an immoral sin. So Paul is telling Timothy, if you belong to God, you can't be involved in immoral sins. You got to depart from those things. And then he helps Timothy with an example. And look at the example he gives Timothy. Now in a great house, there are not only vessels of gold and silver, but also of wood and clay. Some for honorable use, some for dishonorable use. He's giving them the example of a house and how in your house maybe you have plates that you eat dinner with, but then you also can have little bowls or, or little tubs that you wash the car with or that you use to, to sweep up dust in, right? So you have utensils that are for honor and then you have utensils or vessels that are for dishonor, for ordinary uses, for ordinary daily uses, right? So look what he continues to say. Therefore, anyone who cleanses himself from what is dishonorable he will be a vessel for honorable use, set apart as holy, useful to the master of the house, ready for every good work. Paul is telling Timothy, Timothy, look, do you want to be used by God? Separate yourself. Do you want to be used by the Lord? Separate yourself from those unholy things. In other words, you have a choice, Timothy. You have a choice. Are you going to get involved in ordinary unholy things and be a vessel of ordinary use, a vessel of dishonor? Or are you going to separate yourself from those things? And are you going to be a vessel for honor? And then look what he tells Timothy, verse 22. He was letting him know that example of the house and to be a vessel of honor. And then this is what he tells him in verse 22. This is the whole point of that story. So flee youthful passions and pursue righteousness, faith, love, and peace along with those who call on the name of the Lord from a pure heart. Verse 22 is amazing because Paul is telling Timothy, so flee your youthful passions. And hang around those who call upon the name of the Lord with a pure heart. Let me tell you this. If you're the only one that is trying to live a life with your convictions for the Lord. And you're surrounded, your friends. I'm talking about your close companions. The people that you spend the most time with. If they're not trying to live for the Lord, eventually, it doesn't matter how much you're trying to live for the Lord. Eventually, they will take you to how they're living. That's just the truth. The scripture says, do you want to be wise? Hang around wise people. The scripture says, do you want to be a fool? Hang around foolish people. The scripture says, bad company ruins good morals. Eventually, no matter how much you want to live for the Lord, if you're hanging around people who are living for the ways of the flesh, living for the passions of the world, eventually you will be pulled in that direction also. So what are two of the main key advices that Paul gives Timothy? He tells him, flee your youthful lust. In other words, don't associate around those youthful lusts. Don't think that you're so strong. Remember, a wise person, they can know their weaknesses and they avoid those weaknesses. They're setting themselves up for victory not for failure but for someone who knows their weaknesses but they still get around their weaknesses they're being cocky they're being arrogant they're being prideful and they're setting themselves for failure but paul is telling timothy flee those youthful lust and then the second thing he tells them is hang around those who also call upon the name of the lord with the pure heart hang around people who also want to live godly lives it's important your friends your associations it's very important who they are and that's your choice. That's not my choice. That's your choice. But it's very important who they are. And look what else scripture says here. Proverbs 25, verse 28. A man without self-control is like a city broken into and left without walls. So he's saying, when you don't have self-control, you're like a city with no walls. What does that mean? Can you imagine your house with no windows? Can you imagine your house with no doors? Can you imagine your garage with no door? Can you imagine your car with no windows and no doors? It's just basically a free-for-all for any criminal, for any thief. In other words, anyone who wants to go in, they can go in. Anyone who wants to creep through the window, they can creep through the window. Because you have no windows, you have no doors, you have no locks. There's nothing protecting your house from unwanted visitors. 
But the only one who should have the key is you. But that's a man, that's a woman without self-control. They're like a city with no walls. Basically, when you don't have self-control, the devil can throw anything at you and you're going to listen to whatever he throws at you. Did you know that your convictions and your standards for living for the Lord have to be maintained? In the book of Proverbs, our Christian life is compared to a house. And it's compared to a house of a lazy person. And it says this lazy person, which represents a spiritually lazy person, a person that doesn't want to make any efforts. Paul was telling Timothy, hey, make the effort to keep yourself as a vessel of gold and silver. Make the effort to flee from those youthful lusts. Make the effort to hang around people who also call upon the name of the Lord with a pure heart. I'm telling you, to, to have victory in the things of God, you need to make effort. You need to walk by faith. You need to take those steps of faith in the direction that you want to head to. Make the effort. Make the effort. Well, the Bible says that there's a lazy man, didn't want to make any efforts, and a little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the hands, and the Bible says that his stone wall was broken down, his roof began to leak, and then it fell upon his head. That's what it says. Poverty came upon him like an armed man. What does this house represent? It represents our Christian life. Did you know that your standards have to be maintained? Your convictions have to be maintained? Let me give you an example. Just because you were saved five years ago or two years ago doesn't mean that today you have the same convictions. Right now, you might have stronger convictions or you might have convictions that have dwindled, convictions that have gone down. Maybe now you're comfortable with things that you weren't comfortable with things two years ago, five years ago. Maybe things that you were stay away from five years ago. This is just an example. When you gave your life to the Lord, maybe today the things that you've grown comfortable to, accustomed to, you kind of grown cold to, and it's just an ordinary thing in your life now. Well, the Bible compares that to a house that's leaking. The Bible compares that to a, a stone fence that's being broken down. If you have that stone fence that is being broken down, if you have that roof that is leaking, it needs to be maintained. That stone fence needs to be fixed. It needs to be repaired. And how can we do this? How can we maintain our life? How can we maintain our standards? How can we maintain our morals and our convictions? By surrendering ourselves to the Lord. If ever you do commit an error, if ever you do listen to the temptation of the devil, don't just become comfortable with it. Repent and ask God to forgive you and ask God to wash you. And also the companions that you have, the associations that you have, the friends that you have, those are also very important. Because a friend can either encourage you to do good or a friend can encourage you to get away from the Lord. And that's what the Apostle Paul told Timothy. He said, flee from your youthful lust. Hang around those who also call upon the name of the Lord from a pure heart. And remember, a man without self-control is like a city easily broken into. What can we do to fix these walls? Practice self-control. And did you know that one of the fruits of the Holy Spirit that you have inside of your life, one of the fruits of the Holy Spirit is self-control. You might say, I don't have self-control. No, you do have it. You just need to practice it. Think of the sport that you're not good at. Think of any sport that you're not good at. Okay. I'm not good at soccer. I'm okay at basketball, but I'm not good at soccer. But if you start practicing that sport that you're not good at, you might stumble, you might fumble, you might miss, you might trip over your own feet. But if you start practicing that sport, your fundamentals are going to get better, your skills are going to get better, and then eventually, and that's the thing with the human nature, we get so frustrated, we get so frustrated. No, 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 don't get frustrated. You keep practicing, you keep making the efforts, and eventually you're going to become good at that sport even more in the Christian life because you're not, you're not hindered, you're not stopped by your athletic abilities because you're getting older. No, even more in the Christian life because the more you put it to practice, the more you practice self-control, the more you practice what Paul told Timothy to flee from your youthful lust, to hang around people who also call upon the name of the Lord, to remember, hey, keep yourself as a vessel of gold and silver, separate yourself from those unholy things. The more you put in the effort in the things of God, the better you're going to get, the more skills you're going to have, the greater fundamentals you're going to have. And then things that used to seem so difficult for you are going to begin to feel effortless because it's going to be second nature because you've been doing it for so long. You've been separating yourself from things for so long. You've been wise about picking your friends. You're, you're very careful of who you let in your circle. And these things are going to begin to give you victory. And the sins that you're struggling with today will not be so much of a struggle later on in the future. Why? Because you're going to be growing in self-control. And do you have self-control? Yes, you do. Just put it to practice. God bless you. I pray this video was an encouragement to your life. If it was, do me a favor. If you're not subscribed, press the subscribe button and press that bell icon so that you can be alerted every time I post a brand new video. And also, if you want to show your appreciation for this video or for this channel, you can do so in one of two ways. 
The first way looks something like this. It's called Super Thanks. Super Thanks is a feature that YouTube provides for creators in case a subscriber or a viewer wants to show their appreciation, they can do so through Super Thanks. If that's something that you're interested in, it's down there at the bottom of your screen next to the share button, next to the like button. It looks something like this. Again, any amount that you give is greatly appreciated. The second way that you can show your appreciation, and this is on a monthly basis, is called channel memberships. My channel offers two levels of memberships. Whatever channel membership level you choose is greatly appreciated. And in return, you get special badges, special stickers, and access to any archive video that I ever post in the future. If that's something you're interested in, you can click the link in the description and you can pick out one of the two levels that I have. God bless you. I'll see you soon, Lord willing. And before you click off, make sure you watch one of these videos popping up on your screen. Have a blessed day.